Hey, hello, hi, welcome to and or back to the Jet Reel podcast. I am your host, Jill Therese, and this week's episode, I am continuing uh, murdering my emails <laughs> um, by answering them on the podcast, because I think that's the best way to do it, since you guys, you know, who are asking questions listen to the podcast, and it makes sense, and that way I don't get repeat emails. So I am going to answer a ton of questions today. So without further ado, let's roll the intro music so we can get a rockin' and a rollin'. All right, we are back and we are answering your questions. I don't know how many more times I'm going to say that, but if you guys remember last week's episode, which I thought was going to be a bonus episode, and then it wasn't, it was a real episode, um, I'm going to continue that and um, answer you guys' questions. I have a lot of emails here today. Some may take less time than others, but I am just going to read you guys the emails and um, answer the question. So um, if you want to write in a question, you may email me at jetreelpodcast at gmail.com. Please do not email Jet Equithery because that is for different purposes. But if you have questions or want to give me feedback about the podcast, you can email Jet Real Podcast. Um, any and all thoughts or any questions you want me to answer on the podcast, please let me know in your email whether or not you would like me to use your name. And if you don't want to answer on the podcast, tell me. But if you're sending me an email to my podcast email, I'm going to assume you would like me to answer it on the podcast. So without further ado... The first question I have is, uh, Hi Jill, one of my teammates is working with a thoroughbred who becomes anxious while leading. I'll attach exactly what she said, but I was wondering if you have any advice. I've been following slash listening to your podcast for a while, and I really like the idea of positive reinforcement, but I don't feel like I'm qualified to give advice. I appreciate your help sincerely. Um, So, yeah. So, the email or photo attached um, is of a conversation um, that says, I have a question for everyone. I'm working with this horse who is a retired racehorse and he's about 12. Um, when you get on him, he's great, but, uh, a legitimate semi truck came into the arena when we were riding last week and he wasn't faced at all. His ground manners are horrible though. He has so much anxiety on the lead line. It's crazy. He's broken two sets of outdoor cross ties. We never cross tie him inside because he rears and we don't want him to hit his head. He's also very, very attached to his herd. As soon as he can't see at least one member of his herd, he freaks out. So super anxious and it's been hard to keep weight on him. So, um, that is a whole lot to handle. Um, so I am not super versed in herd anxiety because I surprisingly have yet to deal with a horse, um, who is herd bound. Um, so, uh, that's, that's tricky. I know, um, there are other people out there that are a lot better at dealing with that than I am. Um, but I can address the other issues as far as, um, separation anxiety. I might reach out to, um, Adele Shaw, who is the willing equine. I know she's had a lot of success, um, helping horses overcome that, but that is a particularly difficult thing to overcome and just forcing the horse away from their buddy and telling them to deal with it is not necessarily the answer. Um, as far as um, having problems in the cross ties go, I would assume the horse is breaking them and freaking out in them because he's trapped and he would like to get back to his buddies. Um, but a s- pretending that he doesn't have the issue trying to get back to his buddies, um, what I would do is work in successive approximations with is like anything. Like if you guys remember last week how I broke down... Um, teaching a horse that the girth is okay and, um, reteaching an association, um, you're going to be hearing a very similar, (laughs) um, solution here. Um, with cross ties, I would, um, you know, walk the horse towards the cross ties and click and treat the whole way and then just treat the horse just for standing near the cross ties and then standing in the cross ties and just treating for the horse keeping all four on the floor. Um, and if the horse is wiggling around and moving a lot, just treat whenever the horse like is still for a fraction of a second just treat as much as you can horses when they are anxious um 
Eating helps bring them down from that sympathetic nervous system so they start relaxing and eating actually does help calm them. If you've ever been walking a horse, like maybe you got them to a new property or something and you're walking them and they're like taking really quick, hurried bites of grass, it's because they're stressed. It's not because, oh, well, he can still eat. It's it's they're trying to calm themselves down because they're stressed. Um, so you can do use a similar logic to help um, in situations where the horse is afraid. You can give them snacks to help calm them and make their body think that things are going okay. Um, so assuming you can get the horse into the cross thighs and he's standing and he's chill and it's not a problem, it's just the act of clipping, um, I would maybe, um, just like maybe, I don't know, I would just really focus mostly on getting the horse to stand still in the cross ties and just really rewarding heavily for that and make the cross ties like a really, really good place to be. And, um, you know, I, I would work up very slowly to having the horse tied. Um, maybe you like faux tie him, like, um, you know, just like put the lead rope on either side, um, of his halter and then just kind of like hang on to that. And, um, you know, if he pulls back, just release it and, um, treat him the whole time and just really make the cross ties a good place to be. I mean, your best bet is just going to be reinforcing, um, the horse standing still. As far as having really bad ground manners, honestly, like in this horse's case, it sounds like everything is derivative of the horse having separation anxiety. Um, I think that that is going to be the biggest thing that you have to work through. And unfortunately, um, just like forcing the horse to get away from his buddies all the time isn't going to be the best solution. Um, I just, I, I have a hard time wanting to speak on how to solve that. I mean, some ideas that I would think about would be like just grazing the horse, like just outside the fence ne near his buddy and then uh, maybe a little bit further away and just grazing him and just getting him used to being like with the buddy still in sight, but able to be calm and relaxed and gradually work up to um, being able to take him away and um, just making it a really good experience to be just a little bit away and then a little bit further and a little bit further. Um, ah, that's just tricky, tricky, tricky. So sorry, I am not like super helpful <laughs> on that one. Um, anyway, I think that's all I can say on that. Um, Next email, uh, bah, 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 bah. okay, I wanted to ask you for the podcast, what is your ethical standpoint on working for Sunny, who, if you don't know, is my boss, um, and taking in ex racehorses, even though you are kind-hearted people and have the best interest in mind, I've heard diehard positive people say they dislike it because it supports the racing industry. Um, I see a point to this because you mentioned Zoe possibly getting kissing spine because she was started so young. And I think that supporting certain aspects of the industry will enable this to happen to more young horses. However, I know some race yards are better than others. Um, so, I mean, I don't want get to get it taken too out of context that I think that Zoe got kissing spine because she was started young. It's a possibility, but that's really just me like it's it's possible um genetics also play a role confirmation also plays a role um but also she just had a weak top line so whether it's genetic or whatever kissing spine for the most part is reversible at least in zoe's case she just needs a top line um but that said that doesn't mean that a lot of horses at the track don't end up with it um but anyway outside of that um I'm assuming that you who wrote in, my dear listener, um, don't know that Sunny breeds racehorses. <laughs> um, so we do take in X racehorses, but like the reason I have Zoe is because Sunny bred her. Um, so Sunny is definitely fully in the racing industry. She breeds and has a trainer and runs them. And um, like Ruler was one of hers that came off the track. Bubbles was one of hers that came off the track. Ghosty was one of hers that came off the track. Zoe. Um, and she has, um, she has several running right now, um, who are probably due to come home. I will say, um, me and Sunny talk about this all the time and she knows that I'm not the biggest fan of racing. Um, I don't think that like the, the industry is inherently horrible and it's this awful thing that needs to be taken down, especially in, um, some of the conversations that I've had with people that are, um, 
like in the racing industry day in and day out a lot of um, the treatment of the horses is actually really nice um and um they're treated like royalty it's the it's the bad actors that um paint the entire industry as this horrible thing now do i agree with um getting on two-year-olds or breaking them in after they're a year old or things like that no i don't and i also don't agree with um you know, beating horses or waving the whip or whatever, um, tactic, depending on jockey. Um, but I don't agree with that either. Um, but, uh, like I'm talking about whipping them when they're they're coming down the stretch or whatever. Um, like I just, I don't, that's not my cup of tea, but that's also goes for many industries. I don't think the racing industry is the worst one out there. Um, I definitely think there is a lot to be said about some of the jumper and Western industries that are way harder on the horses and way worse, um, in terms of drugging and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, that doesn't mean that that makes the racing industry, you know, exalted. Um, but I, I don't think it's something that needs to be like super attacked. A lot of those horses are really well cared for, cared for, like, um, you know, my boss, and I talk about it and she knows that I don't like racing, but I do respect the way that she does it. Cause if she's going to do it, the way that she does it is the better way. <laughs> um, she listens to all of her horses. If they start, um, you know, if they're just not running super fast or they aren't doing super well, or if, um, you know, there's a problem, she fixes it or she retires them. She doesn't push them. She doesn't drug them or inject, inject, inject to keep them running until they're absolutely broken down. Um, and most good trainers don't do that anyway. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that I would never take a horse off the track because I don't want to support the racing industry because of things like kissing spine and stuff. I think that's way too simplified. I mean, that would be like saying I don't want to buy a jumping horse because I don't support, um, you know, using heavy bits and whips and spurs and, um, you know, jumping young horses because a lot of, a lot, a lot of like eventing and show jumping both have horses that are like five years old jumping way too high and their backs aren't even set then, you know, I mean, that's arguably worse than racing a two-year-old and, um, cause of all the impact and stuff and the training that has to be done before that, um, to get them there so fast, like it's just, mm, nobody's innocent. And, um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't demonize an entire industry, um, because, and like refuse, I mean, it's like what people do with kill pins, you know, you don't want to support the kill pin, so you don't save the horses. And I mean, like me refusing to take a horse from, um, a racetrack, uh, would be no better than refusing to take a horse from a show jumping home. I mean, and, and also like that's, it's grouping everybody in the same category. It's saying that everyone does all of these horrible things. They're the worst of the worst of the industry. No, it's only a few select people and you can choose who to buy from. You know, if the trainer is super awful, then you can choose to not support them. But also, you know, me and Sunny always talk about it because we do have kill pin rescues out here and we hate to support the kill pins. That's not something that we'd like to do, obviously. But, you know, do you send the horse to slaughter in hopes that it'll end the industry? Like, I mean, I don't know. And that's how we end up with kill pin horses because we can't do it. <laughs> um, but beyond that, um, there, it's not me. I'm not taking the horses in. So I don't really have a say in it. You know, if Sonny wants to bring a horse in from a kill pen or off the track, I don't really have a say in it. And honestly, um, anything is better than most of those situations that they come from. Um, and I would love to work with them and give them another shot at life, um, rather than just leaving them to fend for themselves. Um, but yeah, that is a tricky question. I understand where you're coming from. I really do. But, um, yeah, I think, um, cause I, I definitely used to be on the radical side where I was like, racing is bad. Screw it. I hate that industry. But now it's hard to, to just point the finger at racing and be like, this is the worst industry in the world. Arguably like there are other, other industries within, you know, horse disciplines that are like just as bad, if not worse. Um, so it's not fair to be that critical of racing and not take a hard look at all the other industries as well that are arguably harder on horses. Um, especially in the young years of their life. Um, okay. Next email. 
Hi, my question is regarding the combination of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement methods used together. I apologize if you've covered material series similar to this before or have mentioned it in your podcast before. Um, I like to think I am an experienced equestrian being at this for roughly 14 years now. I have brought up multiple horses now and just love the process. I have always ridden with the same trainer who has taught me many things and I have respect for her, but her ideas on the negative pressure si- are are on the negative pressure side and the tra- and the traditional ride ideals riding i guess um the current horse i have i have trained since he was three he's eight now um but i am in a situation where i cannot control not using pressure and negative reinforcement as i still take regular lessons under my trainer and due to costs and land restrictions i can't take my horse home he has to be barred- boarded at this barn <clears throat> sorry i can't read but I really want to include positive training in my future, which I am still a complete virgin to, so I'll have to cross the bridge when I get to it. With that in mind, the main question and concern I have, do you think it would be at all beneficial if I was to still ride traditionally and with negative reinforcement in my lessons and use positive reinforcement while doing groundwork and free rides and hacking? <clears throat> Is it possible to use both or will I just frustrate my horse? Um, I want to add that I really enjoy your podcast. You talk about so many points that really hit home for me personally. I don't know that any of that is relevant to the question. Yes, it's just nice and very complimentary. It makes me very happy. Um, anyway, addressing the question. Um, yeah, so it is possible. And this is how a lot of people start. Honestly, I would not really recommend doing what I did. Uh, and if you were <clears throat> unfamiliar with what I did, it was, I went from traditional riding to switching entirely to positive reinforcement and being kind of a Nazi about it and, uh, preaching from the rooftops, um, that it is the only way when I did not really know anything. Um, I definitely think that there is a way to step into it slowly. And honestly, like I said, it's a little bit better because you don't get so paralyzed because what happened to me is I was like, I want everything to be positive reinforcement. So I just did that. And then I was like, uh, okay, but I don't know how to do everything positive reinforcement. Like, I don't know how to lead. I don't know how to ride. I don't know how to do any of this stuff with positive reinforcement. So I just can't do it. Like, I couldn't even lead my horse out of her paddock. So, um, it's honestly better if you just take baby steps and work your way into it until you know what you're doing. Um, Alexander Curland, who is like one of the people that started clicker training and positive reinforcement with horses, um, her, one of her phrases is, um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Obviously that that's one, but like, um, don't throw something out unless you have something to put in its place. You can't just stop leading your horse, um, with a leader open halter and still get from point A to point B. You have to learn how to replace that. So, um, you know, you can do what I did where you just leave your horse in a paddock and t- until you figure it out, or you can, um, uh, just work in increments. And I think that that works the best for a lot of people because they don't get so overwhelmed and you can just focus on little things until you build up to being able to do an entire training philosophy off of it if you would like. But you also don't have to do that. You can just play around with positive reinforcement. I know there's like a huge community on Twitter of people that do that and I fucking love Twitter for that reason. You know, I gotta say, I'll, it's crazy because there have been tweets that I have been reading lately that are just like, if you're not studying up on behavioral science, you are doing your horse a disservice. Like, just like really just like out there, positive reinforcement, blatant shaming people for um, not looking into the science. And I am like, wow, I would have gotten lit on fire for saying that stuff a year ago. Um, but it's it's crazy how far people have come. And I think a lot of people are starting to really open their minds to it and, um, which is incredible. So I'm happy that you're willing to try. Um, it is, it is definitely revolutionary for your relationship with your horse. I think, I think that it makes a world of difference. Um, so you can use them together. Generally, I recommend that you keep the sessions separate. Um, like if you're going to do a positive reinforcement session, don't go get on ride immediately after. Like what I would do is I would ride and then put the horse away, give it like 10, 15 minutes or something like just a break. So it's clearly a different session. Uh, and then, uh, do your positive reinforcement session or do them on different days. Um, I mean, like you can, you can break it up and, um, you know, something to watch out for is usually you get criticized for it. Um, I know that when I tried to do things of that nature at my barn, 
Bourne? Where are you from? Um, Barn. Uh, I got criticized, told I was being too soft, I didn't need to train with treats, and you just kind of have to nod your head and be like, yeah, yeah, okay, I know what I'm doing. Um, and, yeah, and I just... I wouldn't get into arguments with people. I would just wait until you can um, prove them wrong rather than tell them wrong, Um, you know. But, yeah, I think that um, it could be really beneficial to uh, just incorporate, like you said, positive reinforcement uh, while doing groundwork or hacking or anything like that. Um, and you know, you said that you're super new at it. So maybe you don't even like have to start doing positive reinforcement right away. You can read up on it and learn about it and use the time, um, that you're, you know, kind of stuck doing things traditionally, um, to learn and really foster your education before you dive into it. Because uh, people, especially me, (laughs) I got really excited about it and I dove headfirst into it and, um, was like, look at all this positive reinforcement that I'm doing and then I was like oh my god wait actually I don't know everything that I need to know yet and um I still don't but um I am learning each and every day um but yeah also if you are a positive reinforcement virgin I think that probably people are starting to assume that um (laughs) <laughs> I'm sponsored, but I'm not. Um, in fact, Mosey does not even follow me on Instagram. But her course, I cannot stop raving about because um, I'm doing it right now. And a lot of the information at the beginning is um, pretty elementary. Um, but that's why it's perfect. Is For me, it gave me a refresher and lots of little pointers and just different nuanced ways of saying the same thing. Um, but for people that are looking to get into positive reinforcement and... Um, you know, 90% of everyone doesn't have a positive reinforcement trainer near them. Um, taking that online course is super helpful. Um, it's called the liberated horse. It's a hundred bucks and like you can ask for it for a birthday present or something because it is so, so worth it. Like I know that's a lot of money. I really do. Um, but I definitely think it is worth it. Um, because I spent a lot of money and a lot of time talking to people and trying to work things out and um, looking all over the internet for different resources and stuff like that. And Mosey puts it all in one place. And um, so the footage is beautiful. The PDFs are easy to follow. And she has journal questions to help you like really think and reflect. And I don't know, it's just a really, really good course, totally worth it. And it'll set you up with everything you need to get started with clicker training. Um, in using positive reinforcement. Um, if you don't have access to that, you can go to my website, uh, which is jetequithery.com slash resources, or you can just go to jetequithery.com and then click on, um, I think it's resources tab maybe. And then I have, um, a favorite products tab, a resources tab and a glossary. Um, and all of that is, set up to help you understand the terms and um, find books and websites and podcasts and that course and all the good stuff you need to get started exactly how I did. I also have blog posts that explain a lot. So if you're looking to get started with positive reinforcement, reinforcement, that is a good um, source for you as well. Um, but yeah, don't, don't feel like you have to like dive into it today. I mean, obviously, you know, you want to get into it, you're excited and it's fun and you want to start working on your relationship with your horse. Um, but it's not going to be the end of the world if it, if you take a week to learn and it might be to your benefit also, because a lot of people dive in head first and they do it wrong. And then they end up with a horse that is annoying, (laughs) that mugs them for treats or is not responding correctly. And then they write it off and they're like, this doesn't work. Um, And I hate to say it, but the only reason that positive reinforcement training doesn't work is because you're doing it wrong. (laughs) Uh, It's operator error every time because the laws of science do not lie. And um, if positive reinforcement isn't working, then it's because you are either doing it wrong or the horse physically cannot because it's in pain or something of that nature. Um, or it doesn't understand because you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, so um, it's it's great because it really makes you take a lot of the responsibility uh, onto your own shoulders and be like, okay, yeah, I do actually um, need, to, need to think about this, you know? Um, so, yeah. I think that that about covers that. You can absolutely use them together. I would advise keeping them separate unless um, you're pretty educated and um, 
can use it in a very nuanced way together, I would caution to just start throwing a cherry on top, you know, like turning, using uh, negative reinforcement, and then giving the horse a treat immediately after. I wouldn't do that. <sighs> Sorry, I had to take a drink of water. And now, the lid did not go on it. Um, on to the next question. Okay. Um, first I want to say thank you. I listen to your podcast all the time and love every minute of them. Thank you so much. I have learned a lot of things from them. You inspire me to keep, uh, with my horse, even when he is having troubles. Um, also I was wondering if you could talk about grieving over a horse because we will be putting the horse I have been in love with for the past year down, I assume. Um, and he had a fusion of his art right front pastern, um, which is experimental to see if he could be sound as, um, he is an amazing horse. It did not get him sound. He's in pain. We're putting him down. Having major troubles dealing with it. So sorry. Um, oh, that's hard. We just went through that with Ghosty. And um, it's there's just nothing, nothing like it. Um, all I can say is to um, really try and keep, um, keep your head up. Um, enjoy every last moment you have with him. And... Um, a lot of people, um, take like a lock of their tail or something and get like a memorial bracelet made. Um, but really, um, a lot of things that are really cathartic for me is like I made a post on Instagram, um, and wrote everything out about Ghosty, um, made a memorial post. I made a memorial video on YouTube, um, just compiled everything that I had of her. And it's really cathartic for me to just watch all that footage and cry and appreciate her and, um, yeah, I mean, just let it all out. Don't bottle it up um, and just feel it. It will get better and just know that you guys did everything you could to help that horse, especially trying an experimental procedure. It's not cheap and that's not easy on anybody. Um, so props to you for doing everything you could for him and, um, you know, being good horse owners. And that's, you can find peace in that and, um yeah, I'm just really sorry to hear that. That's pretty much all the advice I have on grieving a horse. It's very, very difficult and very not fun. Um, anyway, next question. Hi, Jill. I've been following you and Zoe for a while. You inspired me to try some positive reinforcement with my gelding major. Bit of background. He's 13 and my friend bought him and owned him for two years. Before she got him, he had been starved on and off for around seven years. Sometimes he would be fed every day for a week and sometimes he wouldn't be fed for a fortnight, um, which I have learned is two weeks. Am I correct in that? Yes, two weeks. Um, and he was in a paddock with short uh, slash no grass. God, that's awful. Um, this resulted in him developing food anxiety among other behaviors such as biting, which presented as being really aggressive when being given hard feed and he would uh, bite when given treats. That's very normal for horses that have been starved. Um, Tiff worked with a natural horsemanship trainer to work through these behaviors. Oh my God. Um, when I bought him, he did still have some food anxiety, which I believe is due to being paddocked with other horses and they would bully him away from his food. Oh my God, also. Um, as well as he didn't have a proper routine as to when he would be fed. Now his food anxiety is gone. Thank God. <laughs> he will still get grumpy at other horses, but won't be aggressive towards people or food retreats. Well, that's awesome. That's fantastic. I was not looking forward to addressing that. <laughs> um, I wanted to try positive reinforcement with Major, but my goal um, is was to be able to use it on the ground for grooming, rugging, and some tricks. Very cool. Watched your videos on how to start and listen to all your podcasts. And we spent a week doing several small sessions a day working on targeting manners, rules of the game. Um, he picked up both of these really quickly, but I wanted to make sure that we have a solid foundation and that he is relaxed and comfortable with clicker training and food reward before I started asking anything more complicated and challenging. I love this girl. So smart. Um, I felt like it was time to try something new. So I thought smile would be a good next step. I watched your video on how to teach smile and went outside to try. Did a quick recap on targeting manners, then started trying to teach smile. He got really frustrated and started weaving along with his line pawing and just wasn't relaxed and happy like he'd been in the past. I asked him to target a couple more times so he could end the session with something he knew and was confident with. Since that session, I haven't done any more positive reinforcement with him because I don't want to stress him out unnecessarily. I've noticed that he is wanting to and offering to target things, mainly me in a brush, but my issue lies in I don't know where to go from here. 
It's very common. Um, do you think it would be worth pursuing positive reinforcement with him? If so, do you have any tips on how to work through this with him? Or would it be safer to stop now to avoid potential stress and dangerous situations from occurring? Um, no worries at all. So, uh, it's very, very normal. I hope that you find some solace in that. Um, it happens with a lot of people. Uh, the horse gets frustrated. It's scary. You're like, oh my God, what have I done? And then you call it quits the end. And that's fine. Um, I don't think that, um, I think stopping is the nuclear option. I think that that is what we do if you absolutely just cannot figure out how to do it. If your horse, he's still targeting you in the brush, like you said, he's, he's wanting to, he's looking for that interaction. Clearly he enjoyed it. And, um, so you're doing well, the horse is enjoying the training, so don't fault yourself too much. So what probably happened with smiling is um you might have raised the criteria too fast um so what that means is you might have waited too long and um then he doesn't know what to do and it's frustrating for him and if he has a history of um you know having some food anxiety it might happen quicker for him than it would for other horses like maybe he has just a little bit of a shorter fuse where he gets anxious um but that's okay you can work around that you just have to be aware that um you have to be a lot tighter with your um, reinforcement. So, um, you know, when you're teaching him to smile, any any movement of his top lip, you know, click and treat him for. And then very slowly start, um, you know, working your way up. Um, maybe what you can do is, um, like, the way that I like to teach it is um, by, like, kind of rubbing my finger, like tickling their top lip and... Um, that quickly transfers to the cue. Um, so, you know, I like kind of like a finger wave, <laughs> like if you can imagine like bending your pointer finger, that's what I do on their nose, just kind of like a little touch. And then when they wiggle their lip at all, I click and treat. And then um, after that, then I just like point my finger and motion upward and then they lift their lip. Um, so maybe what you want to do is just kind of tickle his lip. And if you're still really wanting to teach this, you could give up on smile and just nix the issue altogether. Or you could actually, you know, teach it if you want to. Um, and just like wiggle the lip. And then um, if he moves it at all, click and treat. And, you know, it may take him longer. It took Zoe, I think, maybe one or two sessions to pick up smile. But, um, you know, it can take a while for other horses. I know people that it's taken two weeks. And that's fine. Like every horse goes at their own pace. And it's not necessarily like a super you know, second nature trick. Horses don't really lift their top lips that often. Um, but Zoe has, might as well have hands <laughs> for lips because she's so dexterous with them. So, um, that was really easy for her. Um, but yeah, so you just have to be aware of that. Like Mac, he doesn't have like a really dexterous lip and it took me a long time to teach him how to do it. Um, but yeah, so just make sure you're rewarding any effort, any like little motion to do it at all. You just really have to break it down. You can't wait for the whole behavior to happen before you click and treat. You know, you can't wait on him to actually smile. You have to teach him how to do it. And that means working in small steps. You have to shape the behavior. Um, so you don't know where to go from here and you're worried about stressing him out. So, um, you know, I think that you can, you can teach anything you want. I mean, with Zoe, I taught her hip target, lowering her head, um, how to walk beside me, how to follow a target, um, how to stand on a mat, um, how to walk sideways towards me, and um, all sorts of stuff. I mean, you can teach them anything you can think of, you can teach them. Um, maybe how to pick up their feet without you touching them. That's a good one. Or how to Spanish walk. A lot of people will do that. Um, and you can do all of that, but with a horse that has a history of food anxiety, even if he doesn't have it now, maybe just keep it in your mind that maybe before you start training, you can write out like a behavior, like say you want to teach Spanish walk. Before you do it, sit down with a pen and paper and break that behavior down. And what is the very smallest, 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 smallest piece that you can break that behavior down into. Maybe it's a weight shift. Maybe it's a shoulder twitch. And you want to work up from that so that you can keep rewarding him the whole time. He's always right. And there's never any moment where he's like, I don't know what you're asking. You know, there's, he always has something to fall back on, you know? Um, like if I can tell that Zoe gets confused, it's usually because she offers 
a behavior that she knows really well. Like, um, usually if she gets confused, she'll either smile at me or back up. And then I go ahead and I don't click, but I go ahead and reward her for it because I'm like, okay, this is my bad. You're still doing good. Let's reset. And then I reset, figure out how to ask the question differently, and then I do, and then she gets it. So um, maybe you're just going to have to do a little bit of extra planning and just like think before you go out there and just start working with her. I know it's very hard to do. It's very hard for me to do as well. I don't like to plan. Um, Well, I do. I love to plan, but I don't like to plan things like that. I just want to go do it. But um, that might be really beneficial for him. And it sounds like he's really enjoying it. So I would really encourage you not to give up. And also working with positive reinforcement can really help him overcome his food anxiety because he knows you're going to give it to him, you know? It might just take some time. Like Zoe's been doing at this for two years, so um, she's pretty freaking good at it. But um, yeah, I think that think that you could be um, really successful with that. I wouldn't give up just yet, but don't feel too discouraged because it can seem like a daunting task, but I think you're doing really well. And everything you said in the email is super thoughtful and considerate of your horse. So it sounds like you're probably the right type of person to to give it a shot. So don't give up so fast. <laughs> oh, my mouth is dry. Okay. On to the next. Um, hi, Jill. I know you probably get this a lot. And I'll start by saying you're my favorite hot podcaster slash horse person to listen to. Ow, my heart. Um relatable, easy to listen to, and it really clicks. It's awesome. I've listened to almost all the episodes and hear you talk about um, the method of new cue, old cue for transferring cues, adding voice, etc. My problem is that the OTTB I'm leasing right now was taught walk on, woe, and back with very aggressive traditional methods. So when I ask her, she gets anx- anxious slash anticipates being in trouble. It's not unmanageable. I just feel bad for her and want to be able to do it without her being stressed. I've tried do- or started doing some positive reinforcement with her, just the basics so far, and I want to reteach the cues I mentioned before, but rather not have to use the old cues as they seem to stress her out. She's very smart, so I'm hesitant on where to start because I don't want to- her to associate positive methods with the old stressful cues. Might be overthinking, but I'm not sure. Um, would you have any advice on a way to teach an old cue in a new way? I value your opinion and would love to hear what you think. Please feel free to answer this in any way you want or not at all. I will not be offended. Okay, so, um, brilliant, 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 very good concern and, um, awesome to do because, um, what you might see happen if you were to try and counter condition, walk on woe and back, um, you might, um, end up poisoning the cue. I think, I don't know, it could work. You could totally just counter, uh, counter condition and have them work well, but if she was taught with very aggressive traditional methods, I think that the easiest solution to this problem would just be use different words. I would reteach all of those with different words, you know, instead of walk on, woe, or back. Maybe for back, like a common thing that I hear people use is a shh sh- sound. Uh, maybe you just use that sound instead of saying back. And woe, um, you could pick another word. I mean, you could say pineapple. It doesn't matter. It's just whatever you want to teach the horse, like halt maybe, or stop, um, walk on. You could say go. That might rhyme with woe too much. Um, you could say forward or, um, move. Like, you know, you could pick anything and, um, reteach that. I think that that might be the easiest thing to do here. Um, instead of, those, like, just trying to counter condition those vocal cues because you'll be working against the baggage. So you can teach the same thing with a different word and then not encounter the baggage at all, if that makes sense. That's what I would do in this situation. Um, you're definitely not overthinking it. That is a very real concern and, um, very, very good thing to catch on to very quickly. Um, so props to you for thinking about that. Um, but yeah, I think that I would just, um, I would just switch the cue and, um, teach, teach all that from the ground. Um, walk on, woe, and back are very easy things to teach from the ground, and maybe you just teach forward, halt, and shh, shh, shh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's what I would do. Um, last one, I think, here. Let me make sure, yeah, I think this is the last one. 
Oh my god. Um, okay, and we're only at 40 minutes. Wow, it's crazy. Um, long time, long time, long time subscriber. <laughs> long time subscriber of your YouTube, and I've just recently started listening to your podcast. I'm not sure if you've already answered this question or not, but here it goes. Um, let's hear it. Um, I have a very smart five-year-old OTTB mayor with OTTBB? How many letters was that? Off the track, they're a red mare. Lots of opinions, lots of energy, and some sass, who I love dearly, and I am trying to find the best way for us to work together that makes her happy but doesn't let her run all over me. Mm. You know, I'm going to stop there, and um, that run all over me is not the way that I like to phrase things. I know what you're, like, I like to look at the behaviors, not the connotation, because, um, in the traditional realm, we like to put um, words like, oh, she's running all over me, she's walking all over me, she's being rude, pushy. Words like that aren't really helpful. What's the behavior? Usually when a horse is quote unquote running all over you, they're walking in front of you, stepping into your space, um, not stopping when you ask them to stop. And um, that's usually the extent of running all over you. So the solution to those behaviors is training the horse to do something else. So if you don't want the horse walking on top of you, reward them for walking, you know, an arm's length away from you or um, staying um, with their shoulder next to you and teach them how to stop uh, when, you know, rain pressure is applied or uh, halter pressure, lead rope, whatever. Um, or when you stop, they stop. Um, you can teach them all of that from the ground. Um, and yeah, then you don't have a horse that's quote unquote running all over you, but saying things like that, um, it's, it's a very small change and it may not seem like it's the most important thing in the world, but when you change your dialogue about things like that, um, it completely changes your outlook. I mean, it's like saying the horse is bad or sassy. Um, that's it. That's your, your search is at the end of the road. The reason the horse is behaving is because it's sassy. Um, but if you look at the behavior and you're like, oh, the horse is swishing its tail, it's, um, nipping at people though. Like, why is the horse doing those behaviors? If, like I said, if you attach like a word like sassy to it, um, or the horse is rude or pushy, then you're done. But if you say maybe he's uncomfortable or maybe he's trying to tell me something. Um, and if you listen to your horse, then you can get a lot farther than just labeling them. And so I encourage you guys out there listening to um, consider like changing the way that you talk about things even if you don't think that when you say it um, it's perpetuating that narrative and um, yeah gets it messed up in your head um, so and then people are afraid to do positive reinforcement because they think that their horse is running all over them when really the horse is just like walking on like walking too close or um, you know maybe walking in front of them and um, that's the behavior you want to change that's easy, easily done. But when you are trying to tackle something like your horse is trying to usurp your authority or running all over you, that's a lot harder to deal with. And using a softer method suddenly sounds like not a good idea. So you see the difference? I hope that makes sense. Um, I have done, continuing the email, sorry. Um, I have done most of her off the track training myself, but I've never found quite the right way for us to work together. We currently do show jumping and she seems to like it, but other than when we are jumping, she doesn't seem to want to work with me on anything else. Up until this point, I've been using more traditional methods, but I've always been told by my trainers I'm not tough enough, lol same, um, with my horse, and if I were tougher with her, she would respect me and then want to work with me, but doesn't quite seem to be an effective approach. I completely agree, and you're starting me on a rant. I can feel it getting hot under my collar here. Um, if you're tougher with your horse, it'll want to work with you. I'm sorry, what kind of fucking dumbass logic is that? God, I heard the same thing recently talking to another horse person and they were like oh yeah like I am not kidding actually said you have to be the alpha and was bragging to us about um hitting horses and beating them into submission like it's some glorified fucking war story and I was like hey dude uh what <laughs> like I was about to throw up just standing there listening to her I was like you can't be serious like you're you're bragging about beating animals? Are you kidding? Like, she's like, oh, yeah, I had this mare. And, you know, she used to just bite. And I would just, like, whap the shit out of her nose. And then she she quit. She straightened right up. And I was like, oh, yeah, she straightened right up. Like, well, oh, I never have any urge to be disrespectful to adults until stuff like that happens. And I'm like, oh, yeah. we're going to get into a battle if I open my mouth. So, anyway, 
Um, yeah, it just, that's such a fucking line. Oh my God. To say, if you were tougher with her, she would want to work with you. No, she wouldn't. And what's, and on what fucking planet? People don't even think. Like, I'm not saying your trainers are the worst people in the world, but like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm very sorry. It doesn't. Um, so listener, uh, who has written this email, um, no, that's just not. In what circumstance have you ever had like an authority figure, you know, be super tough on you? Like, you know, pulling you around by your face or smacking you in the nose or shanking your lead rope or anything that people classify as being tougher on the horse. In what circumstance would that ever make you want to be with that person ever again? Newsflash, horses work the same way. If you're beating on them all the time, they do not want to be around you. They're afraid of you and honestly more likely to run you over or to be in your space because they are afraid of you. And so they're not thinking. They're in flight mode. They're trying to get away. So, uh, 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 that doesn't make any fucking sense at all. And it just blows my mind that people think like that. It doesn't make any sense at all. And I can't believe that I ever actually believe the same fucking thing. That makes no sense. Anyway, sorry. Swearing a lot. It really frustrates me. Okay. Continuing her email. I agree. It doesn't seem to be an effective approach. Um, continuing the email. I'm interested in positive reinforcement, but I'm not sure how to tailor it to a horse like her with a crafty brain and a strong will. Again... Uh, the arbitrary words doesn't make any sense zoe ha- is smart and is strong-willed i mean like when i wrote her i would have labeled her like when i wrote her traditionally i would have also labeled her a sassy strong-willed mare but really she just doesn't like to be pulled on or hit or kicked or forced into doing shit and i don't blame her who does um so yeah and i mean crafty brain like they're just smart they're animals they're we're all smart <laughs> um so anyway, have any suggestions on how I might make her working with me something she would look forward to instead of just tolerating or trying to avoid. I just want her enjoy to enjoy the time we spend together. If you could possibly give me any suggestions, it'd be greatly appreciated. So yeah, of course. Um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant sentiment. Wanting your horse to want to work with you and um, enjoy the time you spend together because, I mean, that's the reality that we all live in. All of us want our horses to enjoy the time that they spend with us, not trying to get away or, you know, I didn't realize that it's not like just how things work, that when you turn your horse out, they walk away, you know, that's, that's what happens every single time, you know, with most horses. Um, and for my entire riding career, every single horse I turned out, they did not hang around. They left. They were like, deuces, bitch. <laughs> but um, when I turn out Zoe or when I go to get her, she is glued to my side. She doesn't want to leave because it's fun and she enjoys it and she has a good time. And that was uh, just fucking alien to me because I did not know that that was a thing. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, it's it's crazy what happens when you actually treat the animal with respect. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think that um, what I would say... Sorry, I got distracted. There was a wasp outside my window. Um, any suggestions on how you might make working with her something she would look forward to? Um, I would start incorporating some positive reinforcement. Yeah, I think um, that, like you say with the ground manners, uh, what I would do with a horse like that <clears throat> is exactly what I did with Zoe. I would start in protected contact. So there's either a fence or a stall door separating you guys and um, teach her the rules of the game or what some people call manners. Um, so I have a video up on my YouTube channel called um, starting clicker training with your horse or something like that. Um, it's a picture of me standing outside a stall door with like positive reinforcement on the cover or whatever. Um, and you just start clicker training um, and, you know, installing the clicker, teaching the horse what the clicker means, teaching them to keep their head out of your space around food and, um, how to not mug and things like that. Um, teach them how you want them to behave around treats. And then after you do that, um, then you can start working in with them. And I know it sounds like such a juvenile thing to be on the outside, um, of a stall, but you have mentioned that she likes to quote unquote be all over you. Um, so, I would start in protected contact just to be safe. And I start every horse in protected contact. I did every single one of them in protected contact first. And um, then you move into working with them in their paddock or in the stall. And if at any point you ever feel unsafe, um, you can step out. And um, 
you know, go back to protecting contact. Um, but usually once you teach, if you teach them the rules of the game correctly and feed them only out of your space, you never feed them when their noses are near your body. And if their nose is near your body, hold your hand all the way out to the side and make them go to the hand. Um, so that way you never teach the horse um, to that when they're in your bubble around your body, when they're quote unquote mugging you, you never teach them that that's how they ask for treats. So that's how you get rid of that behavior. Very easy. Um, and so I would teach that first and then I would work on it in the stall or in the paddock with them. And then I would just start doing some work at Liberty, you know, teaching them to follow a target maybe, um, at a distance from your body, how to stop with you, how to start walking with you and do all of it at Liberty. And then you can start incorporating a halter and then, um, honestly, like with Zoe, that all just went away on its own. Cause Zoe was what most would call rude or pushy or all over me. And she was honestly just a hellion to lead. She was so bad. Um, but through working with her with positive reinforcement, um, you know, just doing a bunch of work at Liberty, she doesn't do that on the lead anymore. She's very pleasant to walk now and it just like kind of fixed itself. Um, so yeah, I would, I would just work on that and start learning how to communicate with your horse and how to ask things of them. Um, like Zoe knows how to walk on from verbal cues and from watching my body. And she also knows to stop when I stop. And, um, I don't hardly ever have to pull on the halter or anything like that. Um, and they, you just learn, a like a very subtle form of communication with each other and you can start using words and you can say whoa and you can say walk on and things like that and not have this horse that's just like running all over the place and you're having to like pull all over their faces um to get them to do what you want um or like I used to have to walk with my elbow in her neck because she was just such a pain in the ass to walk um but yeah so I would I would work on that and fix the groundwork issue like you said she's great when you're um, riding and jumping, but she doesn't seem to want to be around you after that. That's exactly the kind of relationship I had with Zoe. It sounds very, very similar. Um, what I would do, um, you know, outside of your positive reinforcement sessions that I like suggested, I would, uh, potentially make sure that, um, all your tack really does fit and that her back is okay. Cause I'm just like very sensitive about backs after <laughs> Zoe getting kissing spine. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes when the horse doesn't want to hang around you, um, you know, maybe it doesn't feel good or what you're doing isn't like, you know, super fun for the horse. You know, maybe the saddle doesn't fit quite right. Um, cause a lot of horses that are still in traditional work that I know, like don't want to leave their people. Um, and the reason that they leave or avoid you is because they're avoiding what's coming. You know, it's, it may, okay, good stroke. Um, your presence may be predicting something that they don't like. So it, may, it might not be the jumping itself, but maybe um, her back is sore. And when she sees you, uh, maybe she's avoiding you because, um, you know, maybe when you put the saddle on, it hurts. And she knows that when she sees you, you're going to put the saddle on very shortly after, or you're going to lead her to make her do something that she doesn't want. Um, or something that doesn't feel good, or, you know, it's, you're just a predictor of things bad. <laughs> and when you're done, she's like, peace, dude, goodbye. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so, and working with positive reinforcement, once you have a horse that is like really game to, um, you know, do stuff with you, it is a really big, big sign that something is wrong when the horse doesn't want to do anything with you then you're like, oh, okay, something's wrong. So honestly, it makes life so much easier when um, you have a horse that wants to do stuff with you. Cause like I said, when they don't, you're like, oh shit, <laughs> um, what's going on here? So I think that it would absolutely be super beneficial to work with your horse in that way. And, um, you know, um, especially for everybody out there listening, if you're looking to get into positive reinforcement, I gave you some resources earlier, but also something to consider is this podcast uh, used to be equine in theory. So, um, the whole first season of this podcast is equine in theory and has lots of beginner stuff on, um, how to get started with positive reinforcement, all the details that you need to know. I bet it's a little bit hard to listen to, um, because it is lots of science, especially the episode that's like, what is the difference between positive reinforcement and not? Um, but all of that I think is very, a very good listen. Um, especially if you're wanting to get into it. Um, 
so yeah give that a listen um especially you listener who just wrote this email um you said you just started listening so maybe that'll be something you can look into um to listen to all of that um but yeah i hope that was somewhat helpful um i would caution you to or advise you to listen to your gut and your intuition it's telling you the right thing that um you've got this horse that you love and you want to work with her and you want her to enjoy it but you don't want to be tough on her like all the people around you are telling you to do you don't have to i'm giving you permission you do not have to be rough on your horse to get anything done you do not have to be rough on them to make them like you i just that doesn't make any sense unless you did some like whack stockholm bullshit like you're not gonna beat a horse into liking you that's just not how it works um so listen to your gut don't listen to the people that are just spouting unfounded claims um listen to science and um follow through do it to it i have faith in you you sound like you have um a solid intuition and take a shot every time i say that word (laughs) um but anyway i think that that does it for that question and this episode i hope that you guys are enjoying this um please like i said if you have a question feel free to write in to jetrealpodcast at gmail.com it's very simple it's just the name of the podcast and gmail um let me know if you want me to ask your or answer your question on the podcast i probably will anyway i'll just keep your name anonymous unless you say hey my name is xyz please say my name on the podcast or you have permission to say my name then and i will um But yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying me answering your questions. I hope they're somewhat helpful. Um, Don't know what I'm going to talk about next week, but yeah, I guess I should probably give some updates here. Um, I have spent the past week dying because I laid out and tanned and then I took some medication. My dermatologist had given me earlier that day and it had sulfa in it, which I quickly found out that I'm allergic to, and I woke up at 3 a.m. that night shivering uncontrollably, could not, could not for the life of me get warm, and my skin felt very hot, but I was just shivering like a madman, and finally, under many pants, pairs of sweatpants, many layers of jackets and blankets and heated blankets, I finally was okay and able to sleep, and then I woke up the next day, drove home, thought I was gonna vomit, um, spent all day sick and with a headache and trying not to die and eventually ended up calling my friend and having her take me to the ER where they gave me fluids and pain meds and then when I got home I talked to my sister who is a nurse and showed her um what was going on on my legs and she was like hey dude uh that's actually an allergic reaction did you take anything and I was like oh yeah then she was like you idiot (laughs) why didn't you say that and I was like I don't know I'm stupid um My forte is horses, not doctor things. Um, So, yeah, I'm recovering from that. Finally feeling better. Um, Today was the first day I was able to actually, like, go out and do stuff um, instead of dying. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, so that's that. Uh, We sold Maze. Um, Miss Mazikeen, our little gray lady, she is sold and going to a very sweet girl who really enjoyed her and just thought she was the most perfect unicorn on the planet, which is always incredible so we are officially out of sale horses dun 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 amazing everybody got a home very happy about that um so now all i have to do is work with all of the baby horses which is really exciting um i have more time for that now which is awesome um but i do think pretty soon (laughs) but yeah i think uh one of our one of my boss's horses I guess Sunny. She's we're on a first name basis on this podcast. Sunny, one of her horses, um, named Icon Who, he will be coming home pretty soon, I'm pretty sure. I think she's gonna try him in one more race, but he's not been doing so well, so she just wants to make sure um he's done. And then when he is, I believe he will be coming home and then I will be starting him, um, getting him ready, um, to be somebody's pony. He's so cute. So cute. I love him. He's a bay. I have been wanting a bay. We keep having greys and chestnuts, and I don't like them. (laughs) I know that's so picky, but I am such a bay person. My icon is gorgeous, and he is so cute. So I'm really excited to get started with him and uh, keep working with the babies and all that. So, yeah, I think that is about all of the updates. Zoe's rehab's going pretty well. Um, Taking lots of walks 
and spending lots of time backing up hills. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so working on building that top line slowly but surely. Um, I've ordered a few fun things to help with that. So, yep, and the chiropractor is coming tomorrow. And the chiropractor came two weeks ago. We had a massage therapist two weeks ago. So very exciting, very fun things. But I think with that, I'm going to call this episode a wrap and be done. Um, that is it. You can follow me on Jet Equa Theory on any of uh, social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, you can follow this podcast at Jet Real Podcast on Instagram and on Facebook. And yeah. Beyond that, you can listen to this pretty much anywhere, and you should subscribe so that you can listen every week. And rate it on the iTunes store so that it moves up in the... What do you call that? In the... Like, it's more available to people. It gets recommended, I guess. Um, yeah. So, with that, I think that is going to be it. It has officially been an hour of this podcast, and... 13 seconds. So with that, I'm going to call it a day. Thank you guys so much for listening and writing your emails and listening every single Tuesday. I will catch you guys in the next episode. Have a good one.